This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I am Amy Goodman. As we bring you part two of our conversation with award-winning journalist and author Naomi Klein. She's in New York to participate in the Occupy Wall Street encampment. We'll be addressing the crowds there. She's the author of the best-selling book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, which focuses on world-changing events around the world, including in Chile, where the shock doctrine uh, is all about Pinochet's coup in 1973 and what happened afterwards, using the theories of the economist Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago, and how a crisis was used to change an entire society. Now, almost 40 years later, students in Chile are protesting in the streets. They've been protesting for months. Now they've withdrawn from negotiations with the government and are leaving it in the hands of the people, their fate. I talked to Naomi Klein about a number of issues, from Wall Street here to the students' demands in Chile and what they feel is broken with the Chilean educational system. They're saying, we want a whole other relationship to education. It's going to the core of inequality, because they're saying the fact that we have this profound two-tiered education system is why Chile has become one of the most unequal societies in the world. And, of course, that has enormous historical resonance, because this was one of the big transformations of the Pinochet dictatorship, was to privatize education uh, and, uh, and, 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 and to, to, to create, out of the country in Latin America that had the largest and most vibrant middle class, uh, the, the most unequal society in Latin America how the origins of the privatization there and how it relates to privatization here of education well chile was the laboratory for the what, what's called the chicago school of of economics uh, it was the first place in the world where the radical ideas of Milton Friedman, who believed in privatizing absolutely everything except for the military, and his disciples went further than him and privatized that, too. Um, th these, are, these were crank ideas in the 1960s, when it was still, you know, a this was, it was still a Keynesian era. And so they weren't able to introduce these ideas in the United States. Richard Nixon came to power. Milton Friedman thought it was going to be good for him. And Milton Friedman imposed wage and price controls and did all kinds of—and said, you know, we're all socialists now. We're all Keynesians now. Um, and, and, and so it was only in Chile, in the aftermath of the brutal uh, coup and, and, and the death of Salvador Allende, that the Chicago economists had their little playground where they were able to road test many of the policies that would eventually be globalized, and they would call that globalization. Um, but it was never globalization. It was always the corporate takeover of the world, and that's what's being protested on Wall Street. So we're very much connected. And the teachers' unions, the significance of them there and here. Um, the teachers' unions, uh, well, the teachers' unions in Chile were, were, uh, I mean, they've been at the forefront of organizing with their students, and and there's been a wonderful cross generational uh, um, solidarity there, and and it's just, I mean, I, I see, I see, it's so wonderful to see. Uh, how inspiring it is for a new generation of activists to come up, and what it does for people who've been in this struggle for so many years. And you saw that in the in the speeches uh, at the yesterday at Occupy Wall Street from labor leaders in in all the public sectors. Uh, they're they're just so grateful for, for this infusion of energy and enthusiasm, uh, and there's a there's a great mutual respect there. Uh, and and I have to say, in a little element of shock, I could sense from the stage, like how did this happen? Them it, scratching their heads, they're in their suits, and they're saying, "We've been doing this for years," and this scrappy group of folks go down to Wall Street. The union leaders are trying to get yeah. in from all over the country and the world uh, to come down to this rally to say, "Hey." This is our moment too. You know, this is the thing about um, about about social change. It just comes when you least expect it. All you can do is 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 be ready, um, and 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 it will surprise you. And this is what's so, uh, I think, un, uh, unfortunate about all the people who are stepping forward to offer unsolicited advice to the to the Occupy Wall Street protesters. All these so-called experts in activism, you know, coming forward and and saying, you know, sit down, don't stand up, don't raise your fists, make a peace sign, and dress nicer, and shave, wash your hair, <laughs> you know, get your messaging together. 
Nobody knows. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a surprise to, to us when these moments happen. As one nurse said to me, um, uh, who was marching, she said, we spent so much time in the past uh, honing this message. Yes. You know, in this corporate culture, Madison Avenue, you got to get it down to a six-second soundbite. And she said, by then, all, everyone's energy was frittered away, because everyone is arguing over, well, what exactly is the message we're putting out? And she said, well, the corporate media is attacking um, and saying they don't have a message. The power is that this has drawn so many people. The message that unites them all is, has a ripple in everyone's lives, whether they have jobs or don't have yeah. a job. And one of my favorite posters um, there was, uh, I lost my job and found an occupation. Yeah. You know, this or thing, this you is know, not a recession. This is a robbery. That's this my, that was my favorite. That was my favorite. I took a I took a picture of that on my phone. Um, no, it, it, th th this line, you know, what's your demand? What's your message? If it wasn't that, it'd be something else, right? I mean, let's let's not get hung up on it. During the 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 anti corporate uh, protests that began, you know, brought, came to world attention in Seattle in 1999, it was what's your alternative? Because our demand was really clear. We wanted to shut down the WTO. We wanted, you know, we wanted to shut down the IMF. Our demands were very clear. So it was, you know, well, what do you want instead? And there's always going to be one of these memes out there that is just really about delegitimizing dissent, and 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 we should get hung up on it. And I think I think it's good that that that. You know, Nick Kristof wrote this absurd column telling the protesters what their demands should be. And they are these extremely sort of wonky, good ideas about how to reform the financial sector. But the problem is, is that I think they're too small. <laughs> and you don't know how big you can dream until you know how big your, mo your movement is. And so that's what well, I think the, the, the Chilean students, you know, they've got a big demand. Uh, and that demand has been enormously galvanizing, one big clear demand for a movement like this uh, that is really going after a system. You know, this is the people who've learned the lesson of pinning all their hopes on the Democratic Party, thinking that they could just change the person in power and that that would fix things. So now they're going after a system and what the demands should be to affect a system this pervasive and complex are by no means clear. We don't know what it is. So it's really about the courage to ask questions w w which we don't have the available answers for, which is something that Wes Jackson, a wonderful, uh, w wonderful uh, poet of farming <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, who runs the Land Institute in Kansas says that, that we have to have the courage to to ask questions for which we don't have the available answers. And that's what that wonderful open space in, uh, at Liberty Plaza represents to me, that, that people are asking those questions and, and give themselves the space to dream big. We're speaking on the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan today, major marches planned for Washington, D.C. How does war fit into this story? There was another poster. Someone said, you know, it is very simple um, to fix the deficit, tax and the, the rich, wars, and the war. tax yeah. the rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's where it, that, that, that's one place where it, it fits in. I mean, we were talking about this last night um, with a group of us, including um, Jeremy Scahill and, and Richard Rowley, um, who I, you've just been, been working with a lot. And th that's the message. That, that we know where the money is. Um, and, and Michael Moore has said it as well, you know, America's not broke. We, it, it has a redistribution crisis. And so we know where the money is bottlenecked. It's bottlenecked at the Pentagon and it's bottlenecked on Wall Street. Um, and, and this is where the sites, the sites of protest ha that has to follow where the money is. It's what any good journalist do. It's what any good in, in, uh, investigator does, follow the money. That said, you know, I don't think that the position should be, you know, stop the wars because they're too expensive. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a morally bankrupt position. Uh, so it can't simply be, uh, it can't simply be a financial issue. It's a moral issue as well. Uh, there, there are, there are, are many, many reasons we should stop these wars, but it is absolutely connected to the financial crisis as well. That said, you know, I always worry a little bit when in, in the U.S. discourse it becomes, you know, why are we, why are we helping to rebuild Iraq when we should be rebuilding America? And the fact is, you know, these are illegal wars. Um, they are wars that, that that the United States owes reparations for. Um, so the idea of just walking away and keeping the money, it's not that simple. And I think we should we should always um, remember that. So there's enormous amounts of money. 
that can be moved from the Pentagon budget uh, to education, to health care. Um, but that doesn't uh, sever the responsibility that, that, that the U.S. owes financially uh, to countries that it has um, helped to destroy. Why don't we conclude, Naomi, with you just describing this moment for us? I mean, you were in Canada. Um, uh, you came down to the protest in Washington, yeah. very much involved with climate change. You're writing a book on climate yeah. change. And Occupy Wall Street happens, so you're here. Look, I spent a long time studying and writing about how elites use ec times of economic crisis to push through uh, radical restructurings of societies in the interest of elite. And it's a great irony in an economic crisis created by deregulation, uh, privatization, corporate rule, that the solutions to the crisis become a d further destruction of the public sphere and more deregulation. And this is what, you know, we hear from the Tea Party right. They want to get rid of any regulation whatsoever. So. You know, I've always said that the only way you can resist the shock doctrine is to know that it's happening while it's happening, and that there has to be a tremendous pushback. And we've seen that in Europe. We've seen that it can, in many ways, st slow the cuts, if not stop them completely. Uh, and the whole world's been waiting for the United States to to realize this and 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 join this global struggle. I think that because this country is so focused on electoral politics, and every two years, all of the energy that is the anti-war movement um, or is the climate movement or whatever the issue-based movement is suddenly changes its attention to, let's try to get the Democrats elected, just has an incredibly corrosive uh, 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 impact on, on the ability to build lasting, sustainable movements. And I feel like that's what people are realizing now, that if you want to if, if you care about these issues, build movements focused on those issues and let the Democrats worry about themselves. Naomi Klein, I want to thank you for being with us.